Today we are looking at a case from the first part of the 20th century. So sit back as we go to England. January of 1914 was a particularly cold month in England. On the 28th of December, heavy snow had fallen over much of the country and this had caused damage to roads and property. Although the snow only lasted for about a week, the new year had started with temperatures only slightly above freezing. Thursday the 8th of January was a particularly cold day and the passengers on the 4.14pm North London railway train from Chalk Farm Station to Broad Street were all dressed in their winter coats. Most also wore hats and scarves. At 4.29 the train pulled into Maiden Lane Station where a young man who worked as a messenger named Robert Stilwell got on to the third class carriage. The train called at the stations at Caledonian Road, Highbury and Cannonbury and although it was very cold, it seemed like any other January day. However, the young man's journey took a terrifying turn as a train pulled out of Midway Park Station. He suddenly noticed a small hand protruding from under the seat in front of him. Frightened and unable to get the attention of the porter, the boy waited anxiously until the train reached Shoreditch. With his heart pounding, he hurriedly ran to the station master's office to report the chilling sight he had witnessed. The station master promptly stopped the train and informed the authorities. The police soon arrived and to their horror, beneath the seats in the compartment where Robert Stilwell had sat, they found the lifeless body of a five or six year old boy who had quite long golden curly hair. The child's face was bruised, there was blood on his lips and marks on his neck which indicated the use of a cord. The train had been doing the same journey backwards and forwards all day so the police wondered how long the body may have been there. A cleaner told detectives that he had cleaned the carriage at 3.36pm and he had not seen a child's body. A post-mortem later revealed that the young boy had been dead for no more than two hours and the cause of death was strangulation. Police wondered who may have committed such a terrible crime. Was the perpetrator someone known to the child or a complete stranger? They also needed to ascertain at which railway station did the murderer get on board. Initially, they believed that the murder was committed before the perpetrator got onto the train and that the railway journey was taken for the sole purpose of hiding the dead child. But who was this poor young boy found under the seat of a third class train carriage? The body was taken to the Old Street Police Station, where later that evening, Mrs Agnes Starchfield identified the child to be her son, five-year-old William Starchfield. Mrs Starchfield was no stranger to tragedy and grief. Her two other children had passed away due to natural causes. She told officers that this had put much strain on her marriage and that she was now living apart from her husband. She added that she had resided with William at Hampstead Road and although she struggled financially, she was a devoted mother. When asked where her husband now lived, Mrs Starchfield replied that he lived in a boarding house at Hanover Court. In the early hours of Friday the 9th of January, Police Inspector Goff paid a visit to the boarding house. He was directed to the room of Mrs Starchfield, where he told the gentleman that he must accompany him to Bow Street Police Station. Mr Starchfield agreed, although he did not know why the police may want to speak with him. Officers then asked him to give an account of his whereabouts the previous afternoon. Mr Starchfield did as requested. He said that he was asleep at the boarding house until about 3pm and when he got up, he made his way to his pitch at the Tottenham Court Road station where he worked as a newspaper seller. He said that on his way, he stopped at a coffee shop. He added that other newspaper sellers would be able to confirm this. When asked when he had last seen his son, he replied about three weeks ago. The officers thanked him for his statement and then told Mr John Starchfield the terrible news that his son had been murdered. It was now 12.45pm and the distraught gentleman left the police station. Although Mr Starchfield's estranged wife had spoken to the police the previous evening, Investigators accompanied her to the police station so she too could make a formal statement. She told officers that the landlady at the house where she lived with her son at 191 Hampstead Road had sent young William to the bakers. 
She said that William completed this errand, and when he returned, the landlady sent him to the stationers at 147 Hampstead Road, as she wanted him to obtain a card, advertising rooms to let. However, the shop owner was not quite sure if the lady wanted a card for a furnished or an unfurnished room, so sent two cards back with the boy. The landlady, named Mrs Longstaff, then sent William back to the shop with the instruction that it was for an unfurnished room. However, the child did not come back. About an hour later, Mrs Longstaff put on her coat and went to look for William. First, she went to the stationers at 147 Hampstead Road. She spoke to the owner, a gentleman named Mr Chapman, who informed her that the boy had not returned to the shop. Mrs Starchfield said that during this time she had been out trying to secure employment and came back at about 3pm. It was then that Mrs Longstaff informed her that William was not yet home. The two ladies then went into the streets in a frantic search to try and find the missing child. At that time of day, Hampstead Road was a very busy thoroughfare, always full of workers and school children. Police did not believe that if anyone had abducted the child, that it would have gone unnoticed. They theorised that the boy was killed before he was placed on the train. Regent's Park was only 10 minutes away by foot. It was an area that in the winter was largely deserted. They wondered if the boy had met his end in some remote corner of the park. It was also only a short walk from the park to Chalk Farm Station. So if the assailant had placed William in a sack, he would not have looked out of place. It was not uncommon to see manual workers going about their business carrying sacks. The line at Chalk Farm Station was a single one, so passengers leave the train on one side and board the train from the other. The train pulls up, so the third class carriage always stops in front of the waiting room. A man could easily have slipped out of the waiting room and onto the train unnoticed. It was also noted that the train gets busier the nearer it gets to the centre of the city. So at Chalk Farm, the train often only has a few passengers travelling on it. The murder of little William Starchfield was reported in the newspapers all across the country. There were headlines such as a lunatic crime and tragedy of young Willie. These made sure that the story caught the nation's attention. It was revealed that the murdered child's father, Mr John Starchfield, had made national newspaper headlines in September 1912 when he bravely attempted to disarm an Armenian criminal named Stephen Titus during a gun rampage at London's Horseshoe Hotel. During this attack, Titus shot dead the manageress named Miss Tower and wounded the barmaid named Miss Grace Ray before running into the streets and wildly firing his gun. Mr Starchfield, who had served in the army and at the time was selling newspapers opposite the hotel, tried valiantly to apprehend him. During the struggle, he was seriously wounded after being shot in the chest, but he managed to hold the man down for long enough until help arrived. Following this, Mr Starchfield spent many weeks in hospital. At the trial of Mr Titus, Mr Starchfield was hailed a hero and was awarded a payment of £50. However, he had received great support from the newspapers and the public and was also granted £1 a week from the Carnegie Hero Fund. Stephen Titus was found to be insane. The police distributed a photo of young William Starchfield to the press in the hope that someone may remember seeing him on that fatal day. The police also made house to house and shop to shop inquiries. A piece of string with a loop and a hair attached was discovered at the Tufnell Park tube station and an omnibus conductor told detectives that shortly before 3 p.m. on Thursday the 8th of January, a boy fitting the description of the deceased child got onto the bus with a foreign looking man. However, the conductor said that the child seemed reluctant to do so. He added that the pair got off at Tufnell Park tube station. This was interesting for the police, as the staircase at the station was a little used in the afternoons and would have given a man enough time to strangle a child and place the body in a bag. On the 13th of January, an inquest was opened and it was announced that the eminent pathologist, Dr Spilsbury, had conducted a second autopsy on the deceased boy. Detectives now believed 
that young William Starchfield was alive when he got on the train with the assailants and was murdered some time between the train leaving Chalk Farm and arriving at Maiden Lane, a period of less than 15 minutes. As investigators pieced together the events leading to the tragedy, some witnesses came forward to tell of their encounters with a child and a mysterious man on that fatal day. The whereabouts of William's father, Mr John Starchfield, was of great interest to the police. A fellow lodger named Mr William Tilly told the inquest that on the day of the murder, he got up at 2.30pm in the afternoon and Mr Starchfield was still asleep. One key witness was a lady named Miss Clara Woods who told of how she noticed a child eating a cake with a man with a moustache wearing a dark coat. She said that they were walking hand in hand towards Camden Town Station. She added that when she passed them in the streets, she said, Oh, bless it. When asked if she recognised the man, she pointed to Mr John Starchfield. This observation was crucial, as a post-mortem had revealed the presence of partially digested food in William's stomach that contained currants. A man named John White also identified Mr Starchfield as a man he had seen at Camden Town Station with a young boy who he believed was William. Other witnesses included a boy named Angelo Portinari, who told of how he often played with William, and at 1pm on the 8th of January, he saw him with a slightly older boy. He said that William was carrying firewood. A signalman named George Jackson informed the inquest that he was on duty at the St Pancras box when he saw the train from Chalk Farm Pass. It was 2.18pm and there was a man with a dark coat and a moustache leaning over someone. Another man, named William Mercer, an engine driver, told how he saw a powerfully built man in a third-class carriage leaning over as if he was tying a parcel. A man named Mr Moore, who was a timber merchant, told the court that he had not seen Mr Starchfield for two years, but on the 8th of January had seen him holding a little boy's hand. He said the boy was tidily dressed. Following the inquest, the jury returned a verdict of willful murder and Mr John Starchfield was charged with this most horrible crime. The funeral of young William took place on Saturday the 17th of January. Over 3,000 mourners lined the streets, their heads bowed as a procession made its way to Kensal Street Cemetery. 30 police officers along with four on horseback, manage the crowds. As the coffin was lowered into the ground, Mrs Starchfield broke down with grief. This was the third child that she had buried. The trial of Mr John Starchfield began on Tuesday the 31st of March 1914 and he pleaded not guilty. The same witnesses were presented who had given evidence at the inquest. His defence team thoroughly cross-examined every prosecution witness and the credibility of Mr Moore and Mrs Wood was called into question when it was revealed that both had seen a photograph of the defendant in a newspaper before they identified him. Mrs Wood was also familiar with the cake shop in Hampstead Road and Mr Moore had asked if he may get a reward for information that leads to a conviction. The defence claimed that this raised serious doubts about their testimony. It was also pointed out that since giving his evidence at the inquest, Mr Moore had been found in a very bad way after attempting to take his own life. And of course, there were also witnesses who placed the defendant in his lodging house at the time the child was murdered. As a result, the prosecution witnesses who had identified the defendant as a man they had seen with the deceased child could not be relied upon and the trial collapsed. The judge instructed the jury to return a formal verdict of not guilty. The inquest and subsequent trial had held a potential for justice, but the not guilty verdict also shed light on the social circumstances surrounding the tragedy. William had faced hardships with the loss of two siblings and the separation of his parents. Agnes Starchfield's effort to find work while raising her beloved boy, exemplified the struggles of working class families during that era. The community's response to the death of young William and the subsequent inquest and trial was immense. 
British newspapers reported the case up and down the country, with people expressing shock and sympathy for the bereaved family. Agnes Starchfield's anguish continued to haunt her, leading her to a desperate and emotional breakdown. In June of 1914, she was arrested after expressing a desire to end her life, burdened by the grief of losing her precious son. Six weeks later, on the 28th of July, she appeared in court, accused of striking a married lady named Lucy Delgano. It was said that she had been on good terms with the lady, but on the 8th of July had insulted her and struck her twice in the face. Mrs Starchfield said that she did this in self-defence. However, she was found to be guilty. The judge said that she appeared to be a neurotic and excitable woman. He then ordered her to pay the sum of five pounds and bound her over to keep the peace for the next 12 months. In 1916, John Starchfield passed away due to the consequences of his gunshot wound. He always maintained that he was innocent of his son's murder. He believed that the murder was an act of revenge orchestrated by a friend of Stephen Titus. Two years later, a man named John Fitzpatrick, hailing from Liverpool, confessed to the murder of William. The 40-year-old individual, who was described as a drifter, provided a story that did not align with the known facts of the case. He was examined by a doctor who concluded that he was suffering from insanity. Consequently, it was concluded that he could not have committed the crime. Over the years, the memory of William Starchfield's murder faded from public consciousness. As time passed, the unsolved case became one of many forgotten tragedies of history, leaving behind only fragments of newspaper articles and archive records as a testament to the boy's short life and ultimately his death. Today, William Starchfield's grave lies quietly in a corner of the cemetery, surrounded by the memories of those who once mourned his loss. The tragic tale of this young boy, forever etched in the annuals of history, serves as a poignant reminder of the fragility of life and the far-reaching impact of unresolved crimes on the life of those left behind. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case